Good morning and welcome to Christ Church Cathedral this morning. I'm Don Bailey Francois, United Church of Christ pastor from Ellington, Connecticut, in here, this Connecticut conference. And welcome to United Church of Christ General Synod. Welcome to Hartford, to this event that's sponsored this morning by Andover Newton Theological School. <laughs> It is indeed a pleasure to welcome you and to introduce to you this morning Dr. Walter Brueggemann. Dr. Brueggemann, <laughs> Dr. Brueggemann is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. He taught at Eden Theological Seminary for 25 years. <laughs> You're not going to get a speech in here. <laughs> and served as professor of Old Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia from 1986 to 2003. He still teaches a Doctor of Ministry class there. He is a contributing editor to both Sojourners and Christian His associate editor of Journal for Preachers. He has taught 34 lecture series, received numerous awards and honors, and is the author of 58 books. His most recent book, Mandate to Difference, an Invitation to the Contemporary Church, is a collection of essays that calls the church to set itself in tension with the rest of the world. Instead of drawing inward, Dr. Brueggemann asks the church to publicly choose a different way, to courageously defy political polarization, consumerism, and militarism. By demonstrating a different way, the church can lead the world forward, and adversaries can be turned to allies and to friends. Dr. Brueggemann's presentation this morning is entitled, The Continuing Subversion, From Sinai to Current Covenanting. Friends, let us please welcome Dr. Walter Brueggemann. Can you hear me now? <laughs> you can't hear me now? Can you hear me now? You, you still can't hear me? Well, then you would have to get quiet. <laughs> well, I can, uh, I can project. Is that too loud? Well, here's the question. Which one of you would like to be next after Bill Moyer? Well, I am delighted to uh, be a footnote to Bill Moyer. <laughs> I'm delighted to be at this uh, great anniversary and uh, to be with you. I'm going to uh, line out things that are familiar to you that I think are important in the church. And the things I will say that you know I want you to be thinking, particularly you pastors, that the great crisis in the church is that people don't know this stuff is in the Bible. <laughs> they don't know it's in the Bible because it's been left out of the lectionary, and they don't know it's in the Bible because we haven't said it. And if we are to begin to do the things that Moyer said, then we cannot take little bits and pieces out of the Bible, but we gotta help the church situate its life inside the Bible. So that's what I'm gonna talk about for a while. There is a contest of narratives that is going on in our society that is urgent and passionate and mean-spirited. It is a very ancient contest, and it is a very contemporary contest. 
The contest begins in the exodus from Egypt when our mothers and fathers decided it was time to leave and were led by Yahweh, the invisible God. And you might like to know that in Exodus 10, in case you're not aware of it, there are two little verses that says, I'm writing all of this in order that you may tell your grandchildren. The, the editors tell us it's a curriculum. It's a curriculum about leaving the national security state. It remained for Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, I know he didn't write it, It remained for Moses in the book of Deuteronomy to turn the memory of narrative into a charter for an ordered society. And I believe that the recovery of the book of Deuteronomy in the church is urgent because it is the first vision in human history about a social safety net. You know it well, in Deuteronomy 15, the cancellation of debts on the poor, no interest to be charged on loans in the community, hospitality to runaway slaves, no collateral on loans to poor people, no withholding of wages from poor people, and perhaps the most remarkable, when you reap your harvest, leave some of it there for the orphan, the widow, and the immigrant. And when you beat your olive trees, leave something there for the orphan, the widow, and the immigrant. And when you pick your grapes, leave something there for the orphan, the widow, and the immigrant. Remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt. Now, if you look at those three crops, what you got are grain, wine and oil, the three money crops. When you are producing your money crops, and then there is a second triad, leave it for the widow, the orphan, and the immigrant. So what Moses does is to put these two great triads there, wine, oil, and grain, and widow, orphan and immigrant, and the big question of the Bible is how do these triads of the money crops and the needy interface with each other? All through the book of Deuteronomy, when Moses announces these hard economic requirements for covenant with the God of the Exodus, Moses keeps saying, remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy 15, 15, you can look it up. Deuteronomy 16, 12, Deuteronomy 24, 18, Deuteronomy 24, 22. Here's a quote from Michael Walzer, the great Jewish political philosopher. Pharaonic oppression, pharaonic is an adjective for Pharaoh. Pharaonic oppression. Sinai and Covenant are still with us, powerful memories shaping our political world. The door of hope is still open. Things are not what they might be. This is a central theme of Western thought, always present, through, though elaborated in many ways. We still do believe, many of us, what the Exodus first taught about the meaning and possibility of politics and its proper form first that wherever you live is probably Egypt, second, that there is a better place, and third, that the way there is through the wilderness. That's Walzer. And then he says, there is no way to get from here to there except by joining together and marching. As soon as they left Egypt, they wanted to go back very next chapter because it's too hard. And even before they left Sinai, you can see people at Mount Sinai in what we call the holiness traditions, Leviticus, Numbers, sorting out people by rank of the 
Goy and the holy people and the really holy people. Scholars call that graded holiness. <laughs> I've been studying graded holiness in the holy of holies, in the holy place, in the outer court, and I figured out that if you put wings on it, what you've got is a Delta airline. <laughs> And I was waiting to get on my flight in Atlanta yesterday, and they listed the priority for upgrades, and then there was a sign that said, if somebody comes along with a higher rank from, from than you, yours may go down lower. So I rode in the outer court. <laughs> the church our church is not immune to graded holiness. There is cultic access in that ancient world that meant health care policy about who has to wait the longest for the doctor. There are moral ratings, good people and bad people, clean people and unclean people, liberals and conservatives, if you catch my meaning. <laughs> There are economic possibilities of grading so that the people in the Mount Vernon School that Bill Moyers described are never going to be productive or live behind a gated community. The resistance to the common good has cultic, moral, and economic dimensions. And there is a collision course early in the Bible between the neighborly possibilities of Deuteronomy and the regimentations of holiness that stand right next to it. But the great resistor to the narrative of Exodus and Sinai, the great resistor is King Solomon, who sits at the center of the Old Testament. King Solomon, you may know, was the son-in-law of Pharaoh, and he practiced his father-in-law's policies. And then he built a great temple. And you can look all this up in chapter 6 of 1 Kings. It says there was an outer court called in the new RSV the vestibule. The, the vestibule in front of the nave was 20 cubits wide and across the width and its depth was 10 cubits in front. And then there is the holy place called in the NRSV the nave, running in the walls of the house, both the nave and the inner sanctuary. The lower story was five cubits wide, and the middle one was six cubits wide, and the third one was seven cubits wide. And around the outside he made outsets of the wall in order to support the sorting beams that would not be inserted in the house. And the nave in front of the inner sanctuary was 40 cubits, and the cedar within the walls had carvings of gourds and open flowers, all cedar, no stone. And then there was a holy of holies called in the new RSV, the most holy place. He built 20 cubits of the rear house, the boards of cedar from the roof to the rafters, and he built this within the inner sanctuary as the most holy place in the inner sanctuary. He prepared in the inner part of the house to set there the ark, and the interior of the inner sanctuary was 20 cubits wide and 20 cubits long and 20 cubits high, and he overlaid with pure gold, and he overlaid the altar with cedar, and Solomon overlaid the in-house with pure gold, and then he drew chains of gold across the front and overlaid it with gold, and he overlaid the house with gold in order that the whole house would be perfect, even the whole altar that belonged. Now this is not, this is not accidental architectural detail. I read it to you because first I thought once in your life you ought to hear it. <laughs> but because this chapter is an imagined social order about who has access. And did you notice the repeated use of the word gold, gold, gold? So Solomon is committed to commodification of all social relationships, and we are able to see what is valued and consequently who is valued. So three aspects of this Solomonic resistance 
to the neighborliness of Sinai and Deuteronomy. First, that Solomon is committed to enormous wealth. It is reported that all the nations of the earth brought him objects and, uh, of silver and gold and weaponry and spices and horses and mules. And when he finally met the Queen of Sheba, the text says he took her breath away with his wealth. Sound like Paris Hilton. <laughs> Second, second, that Solomon, Solomon is committed to power, what he is described at, if you look at it carefully, he is an arms dealer, that's what he does. He moves horses and chariots from the south to the north and the north to the south, and every time he does it, he takes some money out of them. And then, of course, he had forced labor, which we call the draft. <laughs> and third, wealth, power, he is the practitioner of great wisdom. He connected all, collected all knowledge. Now you might think that's innocent, but I see the heavy hand of the intelligence community and Dick Cheney who said none of it is recountable to anybody. So wisdom, see if this works for you, wisdom in the text of Solomon is about championing the arts in a way that would enhance the regime, the practice of discernment for governance, and a monopoly on intelligence. Solomon is celebrated for his worldly awareness, perhaps in the same way that the famous wise men, you know that book, the wise men clustered around Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon, of whom Henry Kissinger is the last survivor. The wise men. And the text says the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his mind. Solomon is celebrated and admired and remembered in the text as the man who embodies the best control of the world, a collage of wealth and power and wisdom. Now for the purposes of my presentation, I want to add a little footnote about which you may not know. In 1 Kings 2, David's last chapter as he hands things over to his son, uh, David does two things. First of all, he says, my son, keep the Torah. And then he says, my son, here's a list of people you better kill right away. <laughs> and the text says that he did it. He killed his brother Adonijah. He killed Joab, the chief of staff. He killed Shimei, who had cursed him. But the paragraph I want you to know about in 1 Kings 2 is that he had to get rid of Abiathar, the priest who had opposed him. But you can't kill a priest. So the king says, according to the text, go to, he said to Abiathar, go to your estate, for you deserve a death sentence, but I will not put you to death at the present time. So go to Anatoth, your estate, and behave yourself. So Abiathar is kicked out of the regime of wealth, power, and wisdom to live in his remote village and to brood. So Solomon is the model in the Bible for globalization that smacks of privilege, entitlement, and exploitation all in the name of the three-chambered temple god. Three chambers that partition social life and social resources for the qualified, the partly qualified, and the disqualified. Pharaoh, through Solomon, prevails and it is, those, it is as though the exodus never happened. Is that a fair description of us? 
except, now get this, except that Sinai continues to have its advocates. They are not shrill administrators, they are not professional liberals, but they are poets who imagine outside the box, who attest by, by their lives and by their words that the world can be organized differently. And the way the Old Testament is put together is that one can see a collision course in ancient Israel that was a long time in coming but could not be escaped. The Jerusalem enterprise of Solomon was increasingly narcoticized, Bill Moyer called it the political class, by its sense of entitlement. It imagined that it was exempt from the starchy requirements of the historical process and so delivered a wonderful kind of an entitlement to its privileged beneficiaries. But the poets notice. And if you draw an analogy between 9-11 and the destruction of Jerusalem in 587, which was Israel's 9-11, you eventually will come to the prophet Jeremiah who presided over the 9-11 with his poetry. It's not the managers, it's not the ideologues, it's not the social activists, it's not the moralists right or left, but it's the poets who are able to go to the depth of the crisis and to reach into God's own conflicted heart. Jeremiah is a village guy. He's not a Jerusalem guy. And the book of Jeremiah begins in the first verse this way, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, that makes him a PK. <laughs> of the priests who were in Anatoth, in the land of Benjamin. His father's a priest, Hilkiah, his tribe is Benjamin. Benjamin is just close enough that he could see Jerusalem across the border. But between Hilkiah and Benjamin is Anatoth, and the utterance of the word Anatoth sets off among us an exegetical alarm system. Where have I heard that before? We reel through our exegetical memory bank, our inbuilt concordance, <laughs> and we arrive back in 1 Kings to go to Anatoth and behave yourself. So Abiath Abiathar went to Anatoth, defrocked from Jerusalem, a rural priest acting as a village pastor, and he had sons. It was very patriarchal. He had sons and sons and sons and sons after them, and they were all priests. They did that for 400 years. Every day for 400 years, they looked south and saw the city of Jerusalem and they heard reports of forced labor and armaments and political marriages and exploitation and foolishness, foolishnesses of a hundred kind. And they heard the mantras about exclusive religion and patriotic exceptionalism and affirmations about unconditional promises from God and uninterrupted presence in the temple and bombs bursting in air and rockets red glare and abuse. <laughs> this is a good list, listen to it. And abusive labor policy and despair and anxiety and self-sufficiency and amnesia, all of which summed up to be an illusion. It took 400 years to gather together a sinking sense of an ending because the people in Jerusalem couldn't imagine that it would end until the World Trade Center got bombed. At the end of 400 years, this son of exile, the Biathar, this son of exiles from Jerusalem, this Jeremiah, showed up in Jerusalem. Then the text begins, the words 
of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, priests in Anatoth in the land of Benjamin. The words of Jeremiah to whom the word of the Lord came, he spent 400 years transposing the word of the Lord into the words of Jeremiah. And the first three verses of the book says, he spoke all that until they went into exile. This is a word from a poet that had been banished to the kings until their displacement. It's just words. But what else besides words will matter when the city crackles in flames and the leadership is seized by an ending that they did not see coming? He had watched this trajectory of Solomon for 400 years. Solomon's wealth, gold, gold, gold. Solomon's power, so that there was no one like him. Solomon's wisdom of 5,000 proverbs. It was a trajectory of death. It was a long-term practice of the lethal. And the lethal does not require more technology or more advocacy or more activism. It requires words of a particular kind and imagine that our church is a venue for the words that name the truth of the death. So I'm going to spend my time on two verses in chapter 9. If you own a Bible, you can look them up. If you don't, take one from your hotel. <laughs> I linger, I linger over these words because they seem to me to be the most important words that came out of that ancient 9-11. And they seem to me to be the right words for us at 50. Do not let the wise boast. And the word boast is halal, which in other places means praise, as in hallelujah. Do not praise. Do not let the wise boast in their wisdom. Do not let the mighty boast in their might. Do not let the wealthy boast in their wealth. Do not praise wealth. Do not praise might. Do not praise wisdom. It is as though the poet has taken a page out of Solomon's playbook and he names Solomon's big three and says, don't brag about those because Solomon had enough wisdom to control all the mysteries and enough might to build a national security state and enough wealth to satisfy every acquisitive desire. And then the line goes on, but let those who boast, halal, boast in this that they know me, Yahweh, that we are privy to Yahweh's purposes in the world that we spend our time not being liberal or progressive, but pondering who this holy God is that calls us beyond ourselves. And then the text says that you know and understand me that I am Yahweh. In the world of wealth and might and wisdom, everybody is an object, everybody is a commodity. But Yahweh says, I'm not an idol, I'm not a commodity, I'm not an object of the sentence, I am the subject of the sentence. I am an agent, not a commodity. I am a Yahweh who, come the verbs, I am Yahweh who creates heaven and earth. I am Yahweh who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh who heals all your diseases and forgives all your sins. I am Yahweh who creates and recreates. I am Yahweh who brought the Lord Jesus alive again from the tomb. And then Yahweh says, I'm going to give you three adjectives that will help you with me. I act, Yahweh says, 
according to the poet. I act with steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in all the earth, for in these things I delight. So I entrust to you this triad of great Hebrew verbs that are at the center of biblical faith. Yahweh delights in steadfast love, chesed, to stand in solidarity, to honor commitments, and to be reliable partners. Yahweh delights in mishpat, justice, to make sure that all members of the community have access to resources and goods for the sake of a viable life of dignity. In the covenantal tradition, the particular subject of Yahweh's mishpat is widow, orphan, and immigrant. I am Yahweh who delights in righteousness, tzedakah, who concerns active intervention in social affairs, taking an initiative to intervene effectively to rehabilitate society. This triad, chesed, mishpat, tzedakah, steadfast love, justice, righteousness, is everywhere in the Old Testament when the Old Testament talks about divine purpose in Israel's life in the world. These terms overlap with each other and are rough synonyms with each other. They assert that the God of Israel, unlike the gods of Egypt, is committed to the covenantal project. And the text ends by Yahweh saying, I delight in Hesed Mishpat. I, I love it. I get up for it. <laughs> and Jesus knew that from Hosea in Matthew 9 when he is eating with tax collectors and sinners. He quotes, I desire, that same word, delight, mercy and not sacrifice. And in Matthew 12 when he's arguing about the Sabbath, he quotes Hosea, I desire delight in mercy and not sacrifice. In Jeremiah 9, in Hosea 6, and in the teachings of Jesus, what is well-pleasing to Yahweh is chesed, mishpat, and tzedakah. Now it will occur to you, if you think about it a little, that these two triads voiced by Jeremiah constitute the decisive either or in the faith of Israel and in the story of humanity. Either wisdom, might, and wealth, or steadfast love, justice, and righteousness. One triad is a trajectory of death because it violates neighbor, neighborliness. The other is a triad of life because it coheres with Yahweh's intention for all creation. And in this poem, there is no compromise, there is no middle ground to this either or. It is a contestation that is designed to put all serious people, liberals and conservatives, into profound crisis. It is the purpose of the poetry to invite the listener into a serious contestation where we will redecide about our future in God's world. And that's all the church needs to be talking about. In the Old Testament, it is clear that Jeremiah's poetry is vindicated by the course of events. Because Jerusalem was committed to an economy of fear, anxiety, scarcity, and acquisitiveness that led to its failure. And in the grief of Yahweh and in the pathos of Jeremiah, it is clear that the royal priestly apparatus never gave the time of day to covenantal economics. And so Jerusalem was left with the poetry, the grief, the dread, and a smidgen of hope. So I want to draw four conclusions, and then we may have a couple of minutes to talk about this. Our, one of our pieces of work is to trace this Sinai-Solomon thing into the New Testament, and the place to hook it in, first of all, I submit, 
is in 1 Corinthians 1 that ends in the last verse 31 where Paul says, as it is written, he doesn't say as it is written in Jeremiah 9, but that's what he's quoting, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in Yahweh. It's a direct quote from Jeremiah, and what Paul is doing is transposing the triad into the New Testament church. This is the chapter, as you know, where Paul has said about the cross that God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. So Paul picks up on two of Jeremiah's terms, wisdom and might, doesn't say anything here about wealth, but it's easy enough to turn over to 2 Corinthians 8 where Paul discusses the church offering and then he says as he bids better pledges in the church, for you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you may become rich. If you move that text over into 1 Corinthians, you get the same triad for Jesus as you do for Paul. Foolishness, wisdom, poverty that contradict the world's overvaluing of wisdom, might, and wealth. And then, as you know, as Paul moves through 1 Corinthians 1, he says to the Christians at Corinth, consider your call. Consider that you are called away from Solomon's triad to the Sinai triad of foolishness, weakness, and poverty. That's first conclusion. Read it to 1 Corinthians. Second, this either-or positions the church vis-a-vis -vis the political economy of the United States. It is clear that since Teddy Roosevelt, we have been busy in the formation of a national security state that now postures itself as an empire. And he talks about the history of empires, including our own, and says that you can count on two things happening to this empire, like every other empire, the loss of democratic freedom and perpetual war. In that context, the define, for defining for all of us who are liberals and conservatives, there is a clear summons to the covenanted people of God to be in acute tension with the theological trajectory of a national security state. We in the UCC are commonly against the war, but we do a lesser job on our sense of consumer entitlement that we and our children inhale daily, which we take as our birthright. And if this analysis and this extrapolation are correct, then the coming troubles of our society may call us away from our internal struggles in the church in order that the church may address the great public missional questions of an alternative to the national security state that is a path to death. In our reformed tradition, that critical edge requires us to ask if the national security state can be transformed by strands of neighborly commitment that lie deep in our history. Third, as I lined this out, I, needed, I thought I needed to ask, where's the bite in this for the United Church of Christ? Because I assume you all agree with everything I've said. Well, first, the Jeremiah has God say that you know me and understand me. This theological rootage has ballast and staying power. And I think sometimes that while the United Church of Christ draws from that rootage, it is careless about the rootage and slovenly in its theological thinking. I believe that we do not do well in sustained, critical, disciplined, theological thought. And I am all for the comma, and I share the conviction that God is still speaking, but it is also important to the United Church of Christ that we remember that everything God said didn't come after the comma. The truth is 
that the great promises and the great miracles and the great summons to neighborliness, much has occurred before the comma in which we are rooted. So God is still speaking, but not for the first time. <laughs> Second, the summons to Chesed, Mishpat, and Tzedakah might be sobering among us. We're all for neighborliness. But I have wondered sometime about myself and some others like me, whether we are very neighborly toward our brothers and sisters in the church who do not share the liberal agenda. No doubt the progressive intuitions of the United Church of Christ are crucial, but it's important that we learn better than we have to care with dignity and respect for those who do not sign on for that particular agenda. The great The great covenantal triad of Jeremiah, of Chesed, Mishpat, and Zedekah cannot be reduced to anybody's agenda, even a progressive agenda. And when our theological passion is transposed into winning and having our way, then solidarity grows thin and suspect. The beloved Jane Hoffman told me this morning about ECOT that I didn't know about, about evangelical conservative orthodox traditionalists in the church that we are under discussion about opening some ways. I think it's an urgent business for us to model how we practice neighborly solidarity with people who we think are clearly wrong. <laughs> Finally, as I thought about Sinai and Solomon and these two great triads, I've spent a lot of time lately thinking about Jesus' words to his disciples about anxiety because I believe anxiety is the main pathology in our society to which pastors must respond. No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and wealth, therefore I tell you do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you shall wear, is not life more than food and body more than clothing. Jesus understands that his disciples were a lot like the rest of the world in their anxieties, and he urges them to be different, to be like trustful creatures, lilies and birds, and less by acquisitive operators. He observes the easy trust and the daily responsiveness of lilies and birds, and then he says in one of his most remarkable utterances, yet I tell you, Even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. This is one of only two times Jesus ever mentioned Solomon. He used it the right way, didn't he? He understands that the Solomonic machine is a generator for anxiety. I heard two tales about that. My son is a national sales manager for a lumber company. And he says, you can't win. If you meet the sales quota, you don't get thanked, you get a bigger quota. <laughs> and I heard Coach Parasegian from Notre Dame saying you can't win as a coach, because if you win and beat the point spread, you just get a bigger point spread next week, and next week, and next week, so you're never good enough. This is not an accident in our society. This is a deliberate program of inadequate productivity that leaves everybody unsatisfied and eventually ruthless. Solomon is the great triad of wisdom, might, and wealth. And Jesus says to his disciples, be unlike Solomon in pursuit of control and domination and safety. Be unlike the triad of Pharaoh, unlike the national security state, unlike the triad of old certitudes, he says, for it is Gentiles, that means non-believers, who strive for all these things. And your heavenly Father knows you need them all, but seek God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and all the rest will come. So imagine some of you younger people We'll be here 50 years from now on our 100th anniversary, and it will be the same hard question, 
how you doing about chesed, mishpat, and tzedakah. The church is the only place in town left to process this stuff. Well, we have a couple minutes. If uh, you would like to, uh, Dr. Bruce. yes. I am from North Carolina, in the heart of Egot Country, at an O and A church. And what you raised about uh, neighborliness with that group is a spiritual, personal challenge. I am on committees with people that would annihilate your kind and mine. How in the midst of that do we live out our neighborliness? Everybody hear the question? No. The question is how do we live out neighborliness with people like that? <laughs> Anybody got an answer? Well, it's not, I know it's not easy. I think two things that you've already thought. One is that we shrill liberals, I'm getting to where I never use the word sh liberal without the adjective shrill, <laughs> have got to back off from our sense of entitlement and correctness. Thank you. I think we do. Uh, I think it's the shrillness of the progressive agenda that feeds this stuff, not only in our church, but in society. Secondly, I think, if it's at all possible, we got to stay closer to the text and not rush to our agenda. I puzzle about why I get invited uh, to speak at some pretty conservative venues, and, and I think the reason is I s try to stay close to the text. And the third thing, as you well know, is endless casseroles. I make brownies for all the committee. Brownies will do. I much prefer brownies to casseroles, so. But you, you see, it, it, it's, it, it's the same thing with the, the Mideast. Uh, there's no use talking to people with whom you agree. The, the problem is talk to people who disagree. And, and I understand it's mean-spirited and closed and all that. But those are the people that God has put in front of us. Did you say in the balcony? Not, none of you are. None of you are old enough to remember Dr. IQ on the radio, and the guy would always say, uh, Dr. IQ, I have a lady in the balcony. So I'd, you, get, you get six Milky Ways if you say the right thing. <laughs> Given the vital importance of these texts, I was wondering what your feelings are on the liturgical practice of standing for the gospel and not for the Hebrew Bible reading. Oh. <laughs> the, the, the question is, the, the question is, uh, what about, what about uh, standing for the gospel? And she said Hebrew Bible, I'll say Old Testament. Uh, well, it's an old custom. Uh, we probably ought to stand for all of it. Uh, the reason, the, 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 I mean, there are reasons of tradition, but the practical reason we don't stand for it is because of historical criticism. We've, we've reduced the words and made them available, and they're not. Nobody owns these texts. There is a, there is a, a line in one of John Updike's rabbit books. He goes to an Episcopal funeral, and he doesn't like the priest because he thinks the priest is a pansy and I don't know what all, but he starts listening to the liturgy, rabbit does. And then he says, he discovered that the priest was speaking the words of the dead. Well, we need to recover the awesomeness 
of these words that do not fit any of our categories. And I don't think seminaries, we haven't done a good job on that, I think. I pastor a beautiful group of people, many of whom are allergic to the scripture or immunized from the scripture, even some of them in their own words. And how do we, as pastors, get rid of allergy and immunization from scripture? for progressive, liberal folks, coming to faith, many of them for the first time, or, or being sort of decolonized, as it were, from, and deprogrammed from, from other times. Everybody hear that? Let's see if I got it right. What, 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 if you, what do you do with liberals who are immune to Scripture? Is that right? Well, you said they've come to faith. Then the question is, what faith have they come to? And if you say faith in our Lord Jesus, then you start with those texts and in all kinds of gentle, pastoral, caring ways, you show them that the Jesus that's there is probably not the Jesus they thought they had come to. And after you do that a while, then you raise the question, where do you think Jesus got all this stuff? And you will find yourself immediately in the book of Exodus. I understand, I understand that this is easier to say than to do, but folks, everybody can do therapy, everybody can do management, everybody can do youth programs. The thing that's been entrusted to us is the text. And the text is a light into our path, it is the Word of God, it is the gift of life. And I think that we liberals, largely because of historical, critical, theological education, have cheapened it, and we got to recover that. Thank you.